everybody. Welcome to Connections Online 2023. I'm Merle Robinson, one of the co-founders of the convention, and I'm here to play moderator during this session. Uh, as part of our effort this year, what we've been trying to do is examine red teaming as one of our core themes. And in particular, we've been trying to look at inclusion for a number of different organizations that actually directly or indirectly support red teaming efforts. Uh, in this particular case, we have folks from Mercyhurst University that are gonna be talking about their program and how they look at and include red teaming in uh, their training for, for students. So uh, I'm gonna start them off. They've got a, a series of things that they want to cover. And uh, I'll let you first do introductions. If you'd start with uh, uh, Lindy and then move to Brian and Peter, we'll do something really short because bios are online. And then uh, we'll start off on the topics you want to cover. Great. Hi, I'm Lindy Smart, the Executive Director of Intelligence Studies Program here at Mercyhurst University. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Brian Fuller. I'm Director of Operations uh, for Rich College of Intelligence Studies and Applied Sciences at Mercyhurst University. And I am a retired first sergeant um, after 24 years of service in military intelligence and counterintelligence. Yes, good, good afternoon or good morning for you folks. Um, my name is Peter Correa, aka the Colonel. And I am currently a professor here at beautiful uh, Mercyhurst University working in intelligence studies. And specifically, I, I tend to focus on the business side. Okay, so we're gonna start with the, the topics you wanted to cover and then move into other content. So the first section you wanted was this. Hmm. Do you want me to bring the slide up deck up right now? Yeah, we could just work through the slide deck. Okay. next slide. So I'll cover the, the first part here, and this is really just to give you a perspective of, of what we do at, at Mercyhurst University, our Intel program, um, CRAT, Brian will talk to us about CRAT, internship program, open source. And then um, myself, Brian, and Peter will give you um, examples of, of how we are uh, leveraging wargaming and red teaming, both in our previous careers and also here at Mercyhurst. Um, next slide, please. So to start with, really just to give you a, a look at uh, what Mercyhurst is, where we are. So we are a fully accredited university. We we're founded in 1926 um, and we are in Erie, Pennsylvania. So you think between Cleveland, Buffalo and Pittsburgh, we're, we're central um, right there. Next slide, please. So within that, within Mercyhurst, um, Brian, Peter and I work within the Rich College. Um, so that's over on the right there. Um, we were named after Erie native Tom Ridge, especially because all the work we do within Homeland Security, national security. Um, so we're named after Tom Ridge. Um, and within the programs that we have in Ridge College, which includes cyber security, data science, political science, um, we're really a center of excellence, not only for those topics, but also all of those programs, we also have online programs for as well. So both in-person and um, online uh, master's degree programs. Next slide, please. So within the Ridge College, we now we're looking at Mercyhurst, the Intel program. And our program is 30 years old. So we are the oldest and the largest uh, 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 intelligence studies program in the world. Um, we were founded by a FBI um, agent and he recognized, hey, we can't do training um, anywhere within the FBI. How do we extend that to, to other people so that we can train not only national security mm -hmm. and FBI, but law enforcement and, and um, the private sector. So we've been around for 30 years to celebrate our anniversary. We have eight full-time faculty, 20, both in person and online. We have about 180 undergraduates um, for our four-year program and then 60 graduate, uh, both in person and online. Our secret weapon is our 1800 plus alumni. So these students are well connected across the globe. They're in 20 countries. They serve national security, Fortune 500 companies, federal international law enforcement agencies, and they are, um, really 
really engaged. And so whether it's ideas on where to do internships or where there's jobs or what do we really do to changes in our curriculum, we focus on that with them too. Next slide, please. So key differentiator for Mercyhurst, part of why we're here is because we do things like board gaming and red teaming, um, scenario planning. We're an applied program. And the, the purpose of that is our, our faculty have had previous careers elsewhere. So within CIA, um, I myself went, uh, led a, a competitive intelligence at Target Corporation, military. And so we bring those backgrounds to our students so that they know how to work through those real life solutions. Um, our students are members of professional networks and conferences. And, you know, what's a little college in, in Erie, Pennsylvania doing with, a, with an Intel program? Um, well, like any, we're a liberal arts tradition, but that makes sense for Intel because we make sure that our students are exposed to national security, crime intelligence, and corporate intelligence. So we focus across that array so they know what they're uh, able to get out of it. Like I said, we have those engaged alumni, um, you know, they're actively involved from the students that were in the first class to the last class through guest lectures, teaching, they're on advisory committees with me and the president of the university. We offer internships and we have mentorship programs. Really what we're looking to do is be sure that when our students leave here, they have the applied experience. They know how to do these things. They have, you know, three to four years of experience so that they're ready to go once they hit the ground running and, and join um, those organizations and agencies. Next slide, please. And so what do we do in the Intel program? Well, we make sure to give them the core courses. They're going to learn the methods. They're going to learn how to do war gaming. They're going to know how to do link chart and ACH. Uh, we focus heavily on professional communication and presentation to be sure that our decision makers know their bottom line up front. We have our strategic capstone where we work with real clients. Um, and we have um, the main focus, again, criminal justice or cr uh, crime intel, national security and corporate. But we know that we have to continue to evolve. And so what we hear from our alumni, what we hear from our partners is that we, we take that into account. And so we work very closely to make sure that we're providing new skill sets to make sure that our students can go into it, enterprise risk management, global supply chain security. And we work closely with other departments, which Brian will speak to, um, to make sure that they know how to work in a CFT. They know how to do those things to mirror today's workforce. So partnering closely with data science, language, um, finance, to make sure that our students are as prepared as possible. Next slide, please. So a few examples of the things that our students have actually worked on. I'm harping on it, but yes, we do national security, crime, and private sector. And so these are real projects that we've done um, with, uh, with national security. We looked at the dangers posed to U.S. diplomat personnel and put together a product that's, you know, went through all the different countries and highlighted which ones are least secure and most secure um, in emerging companies to watch for. We worked to understand, you know, the distribution of uh, fentanyl or um, actually working to find people that are in human trafficking. And um, so within the crime intel, we're looking using link charts, time and uh, timeline analysis to, to bring those things forward. And in the private sector, a recent example is we worked with a, a um, pharmaceutical company to look at of their 120 locations across the globe, what will most be at risk within uh, climate change for the next five to 10 years. So helping them prioritize where they should um, look at investment in their own property. So again, applied experience with our students. Um, next slide, please. And I'll pass it over to Brian to share about uh, opportunities our students have outside of the classroom. All right, thanks, Lindy. Next slide. All right, so uh, you got a quick introduction from me, but I do feel it's important that you know who we are and who you're talking to and what kind of gives us uh, the expertise to be able to talk on the topics we're talking on today. Um, I have a very strong background from my military service uh, in uh, tactical and strategic intelligence and the war gaming that goes along with that. I've done a, probably a couple thousand war games uh, over my military career. And then one of the things is how did we take the, you know, everything from that background when I came into academics and into the private side, how do I transition what's worked in the, in the military and apply it to 
what is a growing competitive intelligence field in the private sector. So this is uh, just a quick snapshot of me. I also worked as a uh, senior open source intelligence instructor for the Department of Army after I retired, uh, before I came to Mercyhurst. And that will come into play later in giving some uh, credibility to our open source intelligence program. Next slide, please. All right, so Lindy's talked a lot about our students getting applied experience. The differentiator is they're, they're learning it from great professors like the Colonel and, and, and Lindy. They're learning how to do it. They're learning about, you know, what it is to be an analyst, how, what it is to war game, uh, what it, and everything in between. But we want them to also be able to apply it, learn it, understand it, and then while at the same time build their resumes so they're really uh, attractive to you know getting the positions that they are qualified for at the mid-level and low senior level analyst positions so years ago when the program first stood up uh you heard me talk about we really stood up under uh national security as our main focus well our students were getting all this great training but our brand wasn't known and quite honestly what we do today as intelligence was still being uh developed and understood so we said, OK, our students have all, all this great training. They're ahead of their peers, but they're getting hired into these entry level positions or junior level positions that they're overqualified for. So how do we build their resume, get them that credibility, demonstrate their ability to, to be analysts and, and apply all of the tradecraft? We said, well, let's let's set up a, a lab where we can have students work on real world projects for real world clients whether it's government, private sector, non-government organizations, and what, uh, get them that experience. But that what it also introduces the clients to those students while they're still students and helping to build and, and mold and mentor and provide that work, but build that talent pipeline as well. And it, it worked out really well, as you can see. We, we work with local law enforcement uh, all the way up to Fortune 50 companies, uh, federal, uh, law, you know, federal agencies in the Beltway. Uh, and as Lindy talked to, you can pretty much throw a stick and hit a, somewhere there's a Mercyhurst University student working. And so they've come back now too and provide all of these great opportunities to our students to get this experience. So within that, we teach, you know, they're applying the tradecraft, they're applying their tool sets, they're gaining that experience, they're building their resume. And if they do it right, when they graduate, Besides having a great education, they can also have about uh, three and a half years of recognized applied experience that uh, pr puts them ahead of their peers who are graduating at the same time, puts them ahead of other students and other programs that are out there. Uh, and we also realized we were sitting on a great capability that a lot of agencies and companies could leverage and use. Uh, and, and we don't run out of analysts, right? We don't run out of those capabilities. So that became a very, what we call force multiplier for a lot of companies in, in private sector or uh, government agencies. Next slide, please. All right, you'll see on here, uh, I don't like to get wordy on slides, but uh, these next two slides are really just to give you an idea of the services that we do provide out of the CRAT. Now, what I will talk on while you're all kind of looking through this is, we actually have a lab that operates much in the same scope of a SCIF. We're not SCIF certified, but we can handle up the confidential information on the private sector side and unclass uh, FOUO on the government side. The lab is under 24-7 is, uh, security, uh, key card access only. We're completely autonomous from the rest of the university on our network. We have our own network, our own servers, everything. Uh, we practice strict operational security and informational security. We protect our clients' data. So anything that we're doing for somebody, only that team really has access to that data because it's even compartmentalized on our servers. But what's great is inside that lab, there's a lot of collaboration. So even though somebody may not be directly working on that project, they may hear about a problem set or something that uh, another team may be providing as a totally different service but they faced that problem before and now they can collaborate and help each other out. So uh, next slide, please. Um, and, and this is the last part of it. You'll see on here really, uh, I'll explain these real quick, program evaluation. So 
we can come into an organization, see your processes, see how you're set up, look at the tools you're using, and kind of give you a third party look from our expertise uh, on, you know, how can we help make things better for you, especially if you're trying to set up your own Intel cells. And then testbed and analyst, um, we actually do a lot of wargaming in this way. So if you have a product that needs tested out, you've developed a new tool, but you're not ready to take it to market yet, you're a startup, whatever it is, you can come to us, we'll utilize it, we'll test it out, we'll exhaust it, um, and then we'll provide you all of that feedback. Uh, a, a lot of uh, companies come to us because they really don't know how to do war gaming. Uh, so they'll come to us and say, hey, can we use you guys to war game out these scenarios for us, or can you develop these courses of action and these scenarios? And then can we go through them with you with the wargaming process and see what the results come out? And then we do certification and course development. So if you, you know, anybody that wants to actually develop their own courses or their own certifications, whether it's for internally for your company or something for an industry, we can actually build and develop those and provide those uh, to, the, to our clients. Next slide, please. All right, one of our big differentiators with our program is our OSINT program. And this is kind of important because this goes to how we are able to do proper wargaming and red teaming and our expertise and everything on being subject matter experts. Our OSINT program, uh, I will put up against any in the world. And that's because we actually teach managed attribution. We teach uh, collection at the tier one, tier zero, one, two, three, four, and five levels. Um, we have the proper technology for doing this. Uh, we have the proper uh, trade craft. And then we have through the CRAT a way to actually apply this. So we're teaching it in the classroom. The students will use it in the classroom. They uh, learn how to mitigate all technical and topical risks through the training. And then they get to go and actually apply that building manage attribution plans and everything um, it, for the uh, uh, clients that we work with. And you'll see that we let our students after they're trained to actually go on to the deep and dark web. So we teach them how to mitigate all technical and topical risk and going down in there and safely doing that and pulling back that data. Next slide, please. All right, uh, Lindy uh, alluded to our internship program. I'll cover this real quick. We run a year round internship program. So everybody knows that, you know, in the summertime you go do your internship and after about 12 weeks, get a pat on the back, a little money in your pocket, but you're just getting good and comfortable at learning what that company does or agency. They're just getting comfortable with you. But do you do you return, right? Is it maybe a year later you return, if at all? Well, we want to keep those relationships going. So we work with a lot of our clients uh, to provide year-round internship opportunities to our students. And through our, intern, our, our, uh, our uh, course uh, offerings, we offer in lieu of doing an in-person class, you can take an internship class. So instead of coming to the brick and mortar, you'll work with a client, um, most of it's virtual, to conduct an internship that's 200 hours of degree related work over a 16 week period. It's about 13 hours a week, so like a normal course with homework. And then upon completing that, uh, the client will sign off that you completed it. And now you have, uh, you know, continue to build your resume, continue to work with that potential employer. Well, again, we don't want it to stop there. We want to keep this pipeline going. And so you can do it up to undergrads can take that elective course up to four times while they're at the university. Three uh, first three credits go towards their elective degree requirements. The other nine go towards their general graduation re uh, requirements. So in our graduate program, the students can take it twice for a total of six credits. Next slide, please. I'm going to pass it over to Lindy. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So, you know, looked at Mercyhurst as a whole, our capabilities, our applied approach uh, to our students, and now specifically talking about um, war gaming and red teaming. Um, you know, thinking about this, we, we realized that between the three of us, we have some really good synergies. So Brian and I, he's you know, led his thousands of war gain. I led about five. So, you know, um, I'm pretty qualified, but we have that experience leading war games. P Peter and I, we have that shared academic. So um, he's a fantastic 
well-respected professor here at Mercyhurst. Um, I lead the program. We have that shared um, uh, uh, academic side to it. And we both were in business. So we both can approach wargaming and red teaming from a business perspective and how we see it that way. Brian and Peter, they have their shared uh, experiences with the military. And so they bring that to the table. And what do we all bring? Well, we all understand experiential, how to, how to actually go through the process to get the student to not only learn it, but then walk through it and apply it. Um, we both have experience in tactical, operational, and strategic events. So really, our shared experience, the way that we come together, really reinforces the expertise that we bring both to our students and our, our partners. Next slide, please. So with that, each of us are going to share a little bit about our about our own experiences. Um, first, I'll share about my experiences within corporate, and then um, Peter and Brian will share their experiences. So for me, um, I did uh, I worked at Target Corporation. I also worked for a competitive intelligence firm where we did war gaming for clients as well too. And so in the corporate side, what I experienced, uh, and from my understanding, is quite different from from the military and national security application. But all in all, the the goal of it really um, is is uh, pretty similar or that shared experience. So the types of war games that we did, uh, primarily crisis reputation management. So the idea with this one is how do you handle a protest? How do you safely handle a protest, allow the protesters to do so against your particular company, um, but without raising red flags and looking like a big jerk? The other thing is we worked with enterprise risk management. Enterprise risk management, what happens if the company uh, gets a ransomware attack? Or what happens if our executive is kidnapped um, or what happens if COVID happens. <laughs> so working through those types of, of scenarios. Um, and I led the, the strategy sessions for the competitive Intel sessions. And that's really looking at something like, you know, okay, of course, what, what happens if and when Walmart does something like that. All in all, the, all the stakeholders that were there we include all the, the C-suite. And the goal of that is to make sure that everybody's on the same page when we have those findings that come out. Um, the team leaders are in there and then with the note takers. So it's a really tight, small group session within that. I think what might be different from maybe what Peter and Brian have experienced is the timing. So we would do this um, on a quarterly basis. And I think the big thing is the time involved. So 30 minutes to one hour prep, that's not the time I put into it, of course, or the team puts into it, but that's our expectation of the executives. They're going to have to do 30 minutes of a read time to get prepared for it, up to an hour, and then it's a two-hour exercise. So it is a very, very quick turn from the start of it um, to, to the breakouts and then back together for the findings. Again, we're dealing with high-level executives. Two hours is a lot of their time to get you know 10 people together. The outcomes, what we're looking for here, a big part is team bonding. And I know that sounds, you know, like, really, that's it. But, but a big part of it is our executives um, across different companies, you know, they're in back to back meetings all day. They don't get the chance to sit down with their um, uh, counterparts and just treat the shit, just be able to just like bounce ideas off of each other. So this allows the teams to do that um, outcome. The teams walk away, so the team leads walk away with both defensive and offensive tactics that they can bring back to both crisis management, enterprise strategy, um, sourcing, whatever the team is, so that they're able to, to um, you know, walk away with something actionable. And it's also a way for us to find signals to monitor. So while the executives get the full experience, get that creativity, get the, the idea of going through the motions of what would actually happen, it also allows the teams to be on the same page as the executives and make sure that they're watching um, the signals on an ongoing basis after that. Uh, next slide, please. And Peter, floor is yours. Thank you, Lindy. Well, let me just say, first of all, I got a couple of definitions here with respect to I being military and having spent 30 years in uniform, and I'm blessed with having a marvelous executive director who we're so glad to have, but I'm also blessed with having a comrade here from, from the Army with uh, Brian. Well, let, make it, no mistake about it, anybody who's ever been in the military knows 
that a first sergeant and a sergeant major runs the army. So, and the, if, and the term that we, that I was brought up with is top when you're a first sergeant. So you'll hear me refer to Brian as top and it's nothing more than to say, Hey, I, I got gotcha. you. And with respect to this whole aspect of, I'm sure we all have that situation of when sometimes we wake up and we say, how in the hell did I get here? You know, what brought me to this particular time in my particular life? And as, as Top reminds me ridiculously, I have a lot more miles on my odometer than people probably on this call. So I have a little bit of a different you know, vantage point by virtue of having gone through this. As I said, this is my fourth year of teaching here at Mercier's, and I'm here for a reason, not in divine or whatever, but this is where I really want to be by virtue of the fact of the kind of learning we, and I use that word, we facilitate. And I, I, if you look at my little slide here, it's, we're, I'm going to walk you through this. I was born in Brazil, that being the flag on the, on the left. I was born in Brazil back during the what was then the Truman administration. So bottom line is I've been I've been around on the planet for 75 years as of June. I immigrated to the United States when I was fairly young, but unfortunately I was very young and my parents were very poor. And I'm just saying that not in terms of anybody feeling sorry for me, but it was just a nature of the beast remembering this then is in the early 50s. With, I was pretty much brought up in Florida back in the, in the 50s into my high school years. I did a little bit of private schooling up in New Jersey, but I realized I, I had to get an education. And being poor, I didn't have any way of doing it. So initially, I, had, I ended up enlisting in the Army. And nothing wrong with enlisting in the Army. But if anybody remembers Enlisting in the Army in 1968 was pretty exciting, but by virtue of the fact we had Vietnam going on, and it was an unpopular war, et cetera. I bring this up only because this was part of my avenue of approach. I was fortunate enough before I was sent to Vietnam, although I was going to go gladly because I made a pact with my maker. If he or she let me live through Vietnam, I promised to come back and go back to school and be a good, a good person. But along the way, they figured out I could possibly, well, they figured out I was comparatively educable as an enlisted guy. And they, for any of you that know, they, they find about 75 of us enlisted folks every year and offer them an appointment to West Point. Well, I'll be honest with you, the operative word for me at that time was free rather than patriotism, but the patriotism followed. So I, I um, started West Point in the summer of 69 as by then a 21-year-old plebe. And if anyone's been to West Point, it is not a lot of fun. It was not the best years of my life, but I did get my stuff together, and I did graduate in 1973 with a degree in leadership and engineering. Although if you ever see a bridge with my name on it, don't go over that bridge. I'm not a good engineer. But I did make it through, already been airborne, so they sent me to infantry basic course, and then I went to ranger school, that, thus the hat. And I bring this up with ranger school only, only because it was pivotal in my world. And in many ways, it's pivotal definitely in the way I am being that um, experiential deliverer of ed education to our students. When I was first day at ranger school, and if any of you ever not, don't know about ranger school, it's about nine weeks of being miserable sleep and food deprivation, and just a lot of tactics. Well, on the first day I was there, I learned, obviously, as a ranger, and it's still in my, I think I my ranger handbook right here. Here's my ranger handbook and top. Look at that. I still got it. <laughs> that as an Army ranger, I'm, I'm supposed to provide purpose, direction, and motivation to any team that I have the privilege to lead. However, however, I need to figure out those skill sets that allow me to do it. At Ranger School, they did this in a magnificent way by virtue of my first encounter of a liege kind with aggressors, with aggressors. This was, this was war game on steroids by virtue of the fact 
that here we had a group of rangers for nine weeks. There was an organization, well outfitted, well uniformed, totally different than us physically and socially, who were our aggressors. And they were referred to as the Circle Trigon. Circle Trigon came about by the need the Army felt as World War II was finishing up, which was our second World War, that we really didn't want to fight in the beginning, but we ended up fighting very well. But they realized they have to find a way to continuously do war gaming to enhance the operational effectiveness of the troops. So these Circle Trigon folks were actually on assignments. They had different uniforms. They even spoke a different language, but they taught me the as aspect of they also had to fight the way our enemy was fighting at that time. So obviously it had moved from a World War II motif to the Korean War and then to Vietnam with the quick kill and the, and the various different ambush Che Guevara type tactics. I went through this and it made a mark on me in terms of thinking about this. And as I, my first assignment was done in Panama, defending the big ditch as an infantry, um, mechanized infantry um, a platoon leader and then an XO. And it really made me think about how do we do it? So I did, I did some more gaming with my troops down there because it was necessary to go through all the what if contingency planning relating to the protection of the canal. This was before the canal had been turned over to the Panamanians. So this is a fascinating time. I ended up getting married during that time. I had a marvelous woman who's still my wife, who was a flight attendant and she agreed to take a vow of poverty and became an army wife. So we had a ball together, ended up getting having two children down in Panama. But then I thought I was going to get out of the Army. So I said, ah, my commitment's done. I'm going to get out and, and become, a, become a bureaucrat or whatever, or hopefully make some more money. Well, a funny thing happened. They also offered me an opportunity. Oh, and by the way, that is the Circle Trigon flag next to the West Point banner. But the, the, the whole aspect of this was they, they offered me graduate school. Now, here's where it gets sort of interesting by virtue of the fact they offered me graduate school, and here I am, an Army guy, at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Well, if any of you know much about West Point people, for you to be going to a Navy school is just about as bad as you can go. It's lower than the superintendent's dog in terms of viability. So I was thoughtful, but the operative word was, Syrac it was my option was Syracuse, New York, and, or Monterey, California. And any of you who've been to both cities, uh, you know I made the right choice. Monterey was glorious. But what it did was quantitatively allowed me to have the skills from a financial specter that, that I could interplace or interject with my wargaming skills. This allowed a, and I think the United States government to their, or the army was, I think was very smart not that I'm such a marvelous talent, because Lindy and Top can attest to you, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the pocket protector. But the reality was, I did have a unique group of skills that the Army saw had value. So I was sent, with ever not ever having an intelligence assignment, to the National Security Agency in 1979. And the reason I bring that up is that I had a whole different wave of challenges relating to the financial aspect and how do you apply that wargaming motif to transactional kind of actions. And as we all know, and I'm, just, I'm not telling secrets, but the financial audit trail is probably the thing that's the most concerning sometimes. And I'm not saying that in an Ollie North kind of way. I'm just being pragmatic. So that gave me an opportunity to practice that craft. Then they, since I was already dipped with my security clearance, then I went to the Russian Institute in Garmisch Partenkirk in West Germany, back when we were cranking out Soviet area officer specialists. And it was there that I really came to grips with the fact, boy, this is fascinating. I've got to figure out how to play this in and, lev and leverage that. 
And I had many of my classmates from West Point attended. And unfortunately, I also had a classmate who was the last person who was ever killed during the Cold War, Nick Nicholson, who was a fellow student there. We'd been to graduate school together. And he got shot by the Soviets in 1985 which once again, I think if cable news had been the way it was, that would have been a bigger deal. But back then it was just sad. I ended up going back to West Point for my last assignment. In the, in the interim, I worked with the Defense Logistics Agency. It was during the, during the Reagan administration. I didn't get much home war gaming, but I was attempting to pay the bills for during that Reagan administration. Because as you remember, we were sending the sending the Soviets to the poorhouse by virtue of the way we were spending. But, you know, so I was negotiating such things. You know, the, remember those 5,000 5, a pop toilet seats that they were selling back then? It's only through my shrewd negotiations. They wanted 10,000 and I got them down to five. But seriously, it was a magnificent, crazy time. But so then this, I was this is great. We, we demonstrated the diversity of the team, but I want to try to get us back towards the topic. Okay. Um, you know, we do have one question from the audience to yes. start off, and then we'll start going through the questions we had talked about in advance. Gotcha. Um, Merle, if, if, yeah, we'll take the question then. If we could shift back to my slide, I think I can get us. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Seriously into the red team side of it. Okay. So we'll come back to that in a minute. We'll come back to uh, this. There we go. And you want to be on this slide? Yes. Okay. So with everything that's being talked about, now you guys all know really where the three of us come from, what our backgrounds are, you know, why we understand war gaming and, and how we utilize it. But what we're really here all for is to talk about red teaming. And to me, red teaming is probably the one part of war gaming that uh, is the most important. And this is why, because a red without a good red team or without red teaming, you can quickly derail a war game or not get the results you need out of a war game. So let's talk about what makes a good red team, right? Well, first, if you're you've got to have somebody that knows your enemy, your adversary, or your competitor. They've got to understand that operational environment. So somebody who's really good at red teaming can be somebody that is part of the war game, part of the intelligence cell was helping develop the plans, the courses of action, the scenarios. Um, but then they need to shift, take off their blue hat and shift to being the red team. Now, what are some lessons learned from what we know from red teaming, right? And this is, you know, Brian's perspective on what I've learned, both from my past career and my current career with the students, because we do a lot of war gaming now in the lab. You have to have a red team that understands all of the aspects that I mentioned, but they've also got to remove their bias. So you've got to have somebody. Bias is the number one uh, reason red teams uh, can't accomplish as much as they need to. You need to have somebody with strong intestinal fortitude, strong knowledge of, of the uh, you know adversary enemy or the competitor and can isn't there to fight against the blue team they're not there to try to win it's not a game right what it is is they need to be able to clearly articulate a reaction or counteraction so with the red team when we do war gaming we have action. Okay, here's the action. Here's the scenario. Here's what we want to do. Here's what we think our company needs to do or our, our you know, operational element, our blue force wants to do. But what's going to be that reaction from the enemy, right? Or the adversary or the competitor? What's going to be that reaction? You need somebody that can clearly articulate from the red team and understand how that what that reaction is going to be. So then the blue team can say, well, this would be our counter action to that reaction and then really drive. OK, well, maybe we aren't thinking strong enough about what our counter action should be. We've concentrated so much on the operational plan that now that we know this is what our adversary is going to re react, how they're going to react. Now we can properly understand the counter action that we should have. Right. 
but that red team also doesn't, you know, they've got to come in understanding that even though they may know the blues plan or the operational plan, they've got to put that out of their mind and simply concentrate in the moment on the scenario in front of them and the action that has been presented. If you have a good red team that can do that, can make the unpopular uh, reaction, right? If you're simply wargaming to go through the motions and your red team wants, already has that bias, as I talked about, or in their head that we need this plan to work. It's not that the output is where we did identifying our intelligence gaps or what we're not thinking about so we can strengthen our plan. If they're simply just red teaming to go through the motion because they already have it in their head, they want this operational plan to succeed because either they were part of it or they don't, you know, they're not in them. They just want to get from A to Z and go home for the day. Then you won't have a successful war game. It doesn't matter how good of a plan you put together, how good of an operation you put together, how much time you put into developing the scenarios for the tabletop exercises or the war gaming to go through. If your red team isn't solid, you will never get the desired output of understanding what you don't see, what you don't understand, what won't work or what will work as well. Right. So if you have a strong red team, that red team comes in, they can also give credibility to the plan and the things that you saw, because you can say, yep, we were prepared for that. Uh, and now we, you know, we had a good counteraction to that reaction from our adversary. In intelligence, that red, you have to have a subject matter expert in whatever it is that you're wargaming on that red team. And they have to be able to also be adaptive. So they also have to be able to be adaptive in the moment because they may see something that originally they didn't when they were planning their red teaming that they now do and can immediately apply that knowledge that they have in a constructive manner to build that reaction, right? So in Intel, what we do is the intelligence analysts are typically going to be our red team, not our operational personnel, but our intelligence personnel. They should be the red team because they should, they're your experts that you go to for understanding an industry, understanding a adversary, a competitor, understanding the enemy uh, when you're doing a tactical. Also, you need someone who's not gonna be competitive, right? So you see the boxing gloves I have on here. Wargaming and red teaming should not be a boxing match. It should be a well-constructed use of time in understanding and respecting, you have to have a respect for each other. If you've got some, when you're choosing your red team, if you know that person's going to be adversarial or you know that person is going to be somebody that is, is going to get angry or defensive or not be able to, to, to properly discuss in a constructive manner to, def, you know, the reaction, the action, reaction, counteraction, don't put them on the red team. That's the biggest lesson learned I can tell all of you is select the right people for that red team that are experts. Um, and a lot of times people think because they're not on the blue team and you put them on the red team, they're not as valuable to the process. I'm telling you, I think the red team people are, are more advantageous or more important to the process than the blue because that, that red team is going to be the ones that get the desired output of finding out what is good, what is bad, what needs change and where everybody's indifferent. So you can properly give your decision maker or your stakeholder an actionable intelligence plan and you can answer their questions with high level of certainty because you properly red teamed that war game. So uh, I don't know if uh, the Colonel or Lindy have anything they want to add from their perspective on red teaming. Um, and we can take questions, Merle, and uh, go from there. So, uh, Peter or Lindy, do you have anything you want to add? And if not, we'll move to questions. No, the only thing I would, I would add is that what Top said is absolutely true. And what we do is make it into the fabric of all of our courses in a red teaming way by virtue of creating those experiential learning vignettes that are real and actionable and have that operational component to them 
that we we all know is where learning happens. Okay, so the first question that we've got is from Aaron Danis. Uh, you use the term training. Is, is the way your program is designed to be training or education? How do you see the difference? It's, it, it, it's both. So I will say there's really three, three words we should use. First is education. Um, we do educate them. It's part of the overall under the education, the intelligence studies program, right? And then training. Training is what they're learning in the classroom. Training is external opportunities to learn more about the trade craft, the processes, how to be an analyst. Um, and then the third word I would say is applied. So we, uh, when we say applied experience, it's different than training. We've trained them. Now they're actually applying it on real world projects for real world clients that are putting these products in front of their decision makers, right? And this is a contractually obligated program. Uh, these students are part-time employees. This is external to the classroom. So I hope that answers the question in that it's really a trifold effect of how our students go from freshmen learning the program to getting the training while they're going through the educational part of it under the program in the classroom to applying it in a real world setting in the CRAT lab. Okay, our next question. Internship. What sorts of internal wargaming are you doing with the students and how does that break down into training versus evaluation and exploration? I, I think Lindy and Peter, I'll throw this one to you guys because you're using it in the classrooms and then I'll jump in at the end. Lindy, you want to, you want to lead off or me too? Yeah, I'll lead off and then Peter, yeah. um, I'm sure you can speak more to this. I think, you know, it's a great question and, and part of it is, um, within the particular classes. So we don't necessarily have a war game class, um, but within each of the different courses, where it makes sense will leverage that capability. So for example, I lead a strategic intelligence class and with that, we have real life clients and it's a, it's a, a term long project. And what the students are trying to do is solve that strategic question, answer that question for the client um, and use whatever methodology is appropriate. So within that, um, if an appropriate methodology would be to use war gaming um, or red teaming, the students will do that versus maybe using a, a you know, a two by two or, or some other form of different. So we use it um, within the classroom. Um, and, you know, to answer the second part of how it breaks down in trading versus evaluation exploration, um, I'd say, you know, the great part about being able to teach this, to teach it as an education is that it's a safe zone. So they're not real, you know, they're not exposed, even if it's a real life client, they're able to explore and train within the classroom. So it's not, you're not making or breaking, people aren't dying because of it, or, you know, you're not losing billions of dollars. So we do use it as, I would say that the form of exploration is allowing the students um, to leverage that with the real client under our guidance. Um, Colonel? Yeah, and I think the, the other thing that's really, I've found fascinating for this particular pedagogy that we use here is that it very it really is collaborative. It's very much focused on teamwork. Uh, for example, every class that I ever teach, the first week, first day, we break into teams. And those teams are not just notional. These are folks that are going to be working together for the entire semester. And then what that does is allows us to do the things. For example, I think Lindy, Lindy came into our, one of my classes the other, other day, and she was able to, in a fairly short period of time, develop a team exercise focused on war gaming and being focused on organizations that, one, they knew, and also that we were very familiar with. And that kind of synergy, I think, is makes for the learning experience. And I, and I can't say enough how much the students appreciate it. And I love the question about training versus education. And because that's a very near and dear to, to us military folks. And I agree with Brian's answer. We're both. Now, having said that, we're not attempting to teach them their first job. But what we do is give them the skill sets and attributes and presence of, of performance that they can accomplish that with that confidence, confidence and character that they need to have. And that is where I think the magic is with all of the wonders of using 
these opposing forces, but with the understanding of disagreeing without being disagreeable. Yeah, and and, and so to uh, piggyback off of that, the types of war gaming that we're doing, um, I can give you some examples, but once they're in the CRAT lab doing it for the applied experience side of it, we're war gaming out things such as, uh, you know, private sector or government, it really depends. So when we're looking at it from a Department of Defense, law enforcement, or, uh, you know, military government, lives are on the line a lot, right? So there's the impact of this and properly developing the scenarios or the, the operational planning, lives are on the line. When we do it in the corporate setting or we're doing it for corporate client, corporate clients, it's about revenue, right? Revenue loss, revenue gain, and under, you know, and breaking, you know, owning their market. So, or weathering something that's impacting the market. So that's the difference in the mindset that we have to put these students in and teach them uh, the difference between a tactical or kind of strategic war game versus a corporate or competitive business intelligence war game. Um, the other thing is an example of it would be China, Taiwan, right? So there's a huge, we have a lot of clients right now in the CRAT that are going to be significantly impacted by China's aggression towards Taiwan. Well, one thing that we brought over from the military into put, I'm trying to put into the corporate sector is understanding courses of action development, indicators and warnings, and how to monitor those. So we have to actually do war gaming in the true sense of we have developed these courses of action or scenarios on how China, based on a geopolitical event, how China can uh, impact not just militarily that region, but how they can impact the private sectors in those regions from supply chains to on ground operations, physical security, intellectual property loss, you know, all of that mark, you know, manufacturing. So it's really unique in the perspectives that we have to give our students in doing the different types of war gaming. So to answer your question, a long winded answer to answer your question is we do a lot of different, uh, you know, we, we try to train the students and being able to understand the concept of war gaming and every, and all the levels and steps involved, but also how to adapt it to their specific decision maker at that time or the specific project. What's been very unique for us on the red teaming side is when we start a new project, we don't really have the subject matter experts, right? These students haven't been in the industry or the military for you know 10 years and understand it all. So we have to find someone such as my myself, if I have some background, Lindy, the colonel, another professor who can come and help be that, that understands that part of the market or that adversary and can red team it. But then our students, as these projects continue to grow and as we do more and more of them, we do have students that are team leads or may have worked on a project similar that we can now bring in and teach to be the red team or can be really good for us as the red team because they are considered to be subject matter experts now because they've spent two years on that topic or looking at things in that area. So I hope that answers your question. So uh, Aaron's been waiting on this one, but I, I think I know the answer because we have been exchanging stuff. You're generating a master's on this, are you not? Yeah, we both, it, Aaron, it is a BA um, and uh, when, so we do have a bachelor's program and then we also have, yes, a master's, master's of science program. That's what, that's what I thought. Um, so can you talk more about your formal coursework that you built specifically around teaching students to war game, whether they're standalone or integrated into the, the rest of the program? Lindy, is that you, you want it? Yeah, I would say um, we kind of answered this with the, the last question, I think, um the the formal coursework i would say like if we had our competitive intelligence class um you know i think it would be the education versus the training first you know what's the background of wargaming how do you do it and then either getting a real life client or coming up with a scenario that the student would do that so over the course of you know several weeks it's building that foundation and then applying it at the end either with a real life client or a scenario so i think uh 
it's most used, I would say, in our competitive intelligence course. Um, and then also with our, our strategic intelligence, the culmination of everything that they learned is put into that strategic intelligence course. So I, I think a lot of our courses follow the idea of, you know, we don't just throw our students in with like, with our human class, we don't just throw our students in there and, and make them, you know, go cold call people and figure out how to do stuff out. They learn the theory of it. Um, they learn the practice, they're given examples, and then they themselves apply it either with a real life client um, or not. So it does, um, it's often, I would say, if we, if it was a, a particular war game, it would be built, I'd say, Peter, what, like a, a two week idea where it's like two weeks of understanding what it actually is and then applying it themselves. Um, and then within um, the strategic intel course, it would be maybe one week of, you know, learning a particular methodology on top of all the other work within within the course. So how do you divide the difference between theoretical and practical education and the way you put the curriculum together? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I, I would say, you know, it has it has to start in theory in the sense of it has to start in the the understanding of the why of the particular capability or the particular um, program we're not going to put our students into national security without understanding you know its legacy and the history of it and having a full appreciation for what all that entails so i i would say though that because we pride ourselves on being applied um, that's always, it's always going to be, you know, maybe it's like, I don't know, Peter, what, like 60% of it is more education and theoretical and 40% is applied. It depends on the course, but, but I think it's, it's just always front of mind for us whenever we're designing courses of how it has that applied nature. No. And, and if I could just add the fact, it, what you said is absolutely true. What it is, is it's, it's, I had to use the building block perspective, but truly when they, when the freshmen first come in, there are certain courses that they have that's their foundation courses in intelligence, the basics. And we teach that and we practice that and they, and they use that as the foundation for the continuation. I tend to get them, get them back for a, at a 200 level course, which is when they first get involved with business intelligence, when we, when we give them a little bit more fine tuning on critical thinking, understanding open source, open source, understanding the whole aspect of, of, of doing these analysis, and we teach them specific skills, whether it's PESTLE analysis, SWOT, or BCG matrix, or all of the other plethora of goodies. But at the same time, we then, as Lindy said, we apply the application by making those experiential learning vignettes practical and hands-on rather than theory. Because I'll be honest with you, and Lindy knows this, I do not give a traditional test in any of my classes, but having, but I do have them apply that. And much of the application is with these team, uh, let's call them red team kind of exercises where there's give and take relation to that. And then it goes on from there. But to add to, add to what Lindy said, that our competitive analysis, competitive intelligence is the next these are folks that we are able to then throw into more of those issues relating to working. But we do them while we have the foundation of what the learning objectives are and what the course is to be about. We're also given the opportunity to do targets of opportunity by virtue of, for example, what uh, Top was just saying, simultaneously to CRAT, I had some of my folks doing uh, doing a study with respect to Taiwan also with respect to China and had some of them looking at it from a, from a, let's say a tra caterpillar tractor perspective or a Walmart perspective or a Alibaba perspective, and then having them come together and basically vying for how are they going to make it through this turbulent time? That's the way we make application we feel happen. So one of the things that we've been trying to do with the conference is to get people to talk more directly about how they look at red teaming differently. And I know that you've addressed several parts of this, particularly with how you've talked about operational security and some of the differences. But one of the things that's a real key is how you define the purpose of red teaming. And I noticed that what Brian had shared earlier, that's very much a respectful approach and an understanding of both sides where in some groups, the job is the red team's there to break you. 
or the red team's there to challenge you with something you might not have expected. Can you talk a little bit more about your definition and purpose and approach to red team? Absolutely. So uh, let me start with this. The enemy gets a vote, right? So a lot of times uh, that can be easily overlooked, even with the best planning. The enemy gets a vote, right? So you need to understand what that vote could be, what that action could be. So, you know, Merle, I like the way you put that with, you know, sometimes red teams are their purpose is to break something, right? It is to break the plan. Well, that's that's great, but if that's the objective is to break that plan, then how solid of a plan do you really have, right? If, if your objective, I think that is just practical applicability to using a red team is you wanna break the plan, but the output is not gonna be the same as if you're trying to work through the plan to see what worked and didn't work. I've seen it both ways. Yes, I, you know, it, it's really your decision maker in, in what they're, they want or your stakeholders and what they want. If they want the plan broke, well, you're already going in with a bias, right? You're already going in with the bias that, okay, I, I'm going to break this, this plan somewhere in there, there's cracks in the plan or there's somewhere in the plan that I can completely derail it and destroy it. I don't know if that's very productive, right? I, I, I'm, I don't see that. And we don't teach our students that because it's not productive. It, you know, I, I, I say if, if the plan is when you're red teaming something to break a process or break a tool or break, you know, not necessarily the plan, but it's a very specific, what's called a, you know, market, you know, plan or whatever it is. Will this work in the market? And you're out there to break it so you can build it and make it better so it doesn't get broke when you take it to market. That's a little different. And I don't really consider that red teaming, right? That's that's not really red teaming. Red teaming specifically exists to build your plan and make it stronger, build your operations and make them stronger. So it all leads to one thing, success. So what is red teaming? Red teaming, the purpose of red teaming is to help identify intelligence gaps, identify uh, areas in your plan that they're, they weren't well necessarily well thought out. And that the purpose of that red team is to find those. I wouldn't say the purpose of a red team is to destroy. I would say the purpose of a red team is to actually strengthen uh, a plan. And if I could just add one thing to that, well said, Top. But I, I hear what you're saying, Merle, and I, but I think it is an issue of somewhat semantics. I think what we, we feel our role in intelligence is, is focused, is to be able to come up with information and data and whatever and make that and transliterate that into actionable intelligence. And we use the concept and the, and the actuality of Red Team and I'll use the term, we pressure test some of those, those yeah. rather than attempting to break them because we feel, to be honest with you, I think the breaking is becomes a little bit old school because I'm not so sure it becomes a collaborative effort. And I'm not trying to be wishy-washy with it. I'm just being candid with the fact that our the words I would use personally would be pressure test. I like that. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Merle? Uh, yeah, it did. Um, now, the, the other thing, because our, the background of many of the folks that are at the conference has to do with uh, wargaming and the concepts related to that. And red teaming can be a component of a that plan or independent of that plan, depending on how people do that. How much do you do in your classes to teach people uh, and the students about wargaming itself? And is that integrated or do you do separate modules on that kind of thing? So... I would say from everything I've seen with the program, it's we teach structured analytical techniques, right? And maybe that's where the theoretical part comes in, but we teach the structured analytical techniques to arm the students with the ability to properly develop whatever it is they're working on in the way of finding actionable intelligence. Wargaming is part of that structured analytical technique uh, uh, training. So structured analytical techniques, I would say we 
use wargaming as one of those techniques that we teach, then train, and then apply. So to answer your question, I would call it a structured analytical technique. We do teach those in the classroom and the theory behind it. And then the students get the opportunity to uh, receive training on it through coursework, such as what the colonel's talking about in the classroom. And then they actually get the opportunity to put it in a, an applied sense, uh, either through their capstones or senior projects or in the CRAT lab. So I added Aaron's comment for just a, a, a comparison and contrast there. Um, so the other thing I well, want to do is just to just to add on to Aaron's comment there, and I think that's where um, it's been advantageous to leverage my experience in the corporate side of how we do war gaming because you got to be quick on it, and so you got to so to be able to kind of you know adjust the process as you go, um, not to cut out you know, the, all the aspects of it, but to be able to condense it and adjust things on the fly to that point of just, it's so time consuming and to be able to, to, to just be able to do it in one class is never enough, but with having the students only there for a few years, um, definitely feel that pain, Aaron. Yeah. So the other thing that, um, you know, has come out from your discussion is that you talked about in your program, the emphasis is on the operational and intelligence activity of things. So one of the things that that brings to mind is from your standpoint, what attributes or things you want to see in your students so that they can run high quality red teams? Colonel, do you want to start? I, I, I think for us, it, it begins with an issue of, of passionate exuberance to perform critical thinking. And by that, I mean constantly be willing, as I use the metaphor, to peel that onion, to be inquisitive, not be not be combative, but to be inquisitive to the point where they are getting that issue of understanding how this works. And to answer that what, so what, now what question that is our battle cry, so to speak, because we're constantly looking for that. So I would say some individual that has the capacity to critical think and has also the ability, which once again, we help train to be able to present that, because part of that is an issue relating to the presentation and the analytical compiling of that information in a, in a way in which it, it allows the decision maker to make a conscious and decision. And, and okay. I would take a, I, okay. I would take a little, little step for uh, even another step forward on them, Bro, is mm -hmm. I think being able to critically think and follow the processes and do that makes a good war gamer. Yes. But I think what makes a great war gamer is someone who can do that, but also creatively think, right? So if they can use the critical steps, the critical processes, and think critically to drive the war game, but there's going to be times where you need to think creatively to overcome something or to respond to something, especially on the red team side, as I alluded to earlier, I think that makes a great war gamer. So as you talk about that, what kind of pitfalls do you think there are uh, in the way a lot of people apply red teams and what things do you try to teach your students to stay away from? Uh, bias is number one. I mean, bias is always to us, I think one of the crux of even being a good intelligence analyst, right? Your decision maker, your stakeholders, they can all have bias. Your operational planners, they'll all have bias. Everybody will always, you know, they always have bias. But as an Intel professional, you need to take the bias out of there. And you, and that's with everything we do. And we teach our students that, right? And so I think on the wargaming side where that equates on the wargaming, especially why I said the Intel professionals should be red teaming is because it should be inherently intuitive for them to already be taking the bias out of it where it's harder for others throughout a company or throughout an agency or a, you know, a military unit to take that out. It really is. And so uh, that's my answer to it anyways. Lindy? No, I think you're spot on with that, yeah. And, and I think the other thing that we do interject, Merle, that I think is absolutely critical is how important integrity and character is to this whole process. And I'm not trying to be, you know, grandstanding with that, but, but I, think, I think the reality is red teaming, analysis work or whatever can only move at the speed of trust. And by trust, I mean the ability for you to trust that person that's in that foxhole next to you. And I think um, that's one thing that 30 years in the military has done for both 
both top and I is that that's paramount. And, and I, and I'll be candid with you. I'm very, very, very communicative to my students that they have to gain and sustain that level of trust. And, and that doesn't mean that the, the Bobos go away when you, when you can trust it, but at the same time, have that trust, especially within your team. Yeah. And I call it credibility. You yeah. know, as an analyst, our number one, tool is our credibility, right? Exactly. It doesn't matter how good you are. Once you lose credibility, nobody wants to listen or trust less Colonel said in you anymore. Yep. Can't hear you, Merle. The next question we have is more into what specific training you have in terms of uh, opposition, because you, in particular, uh, you talked about when you work with Target and some of these private companies, how they look at competition and opponents, you know, the role of an opponent. Could you talk a little bit more about how you play opponents in these games uh, using the intelligence perspective that you've got? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I like how the questions talking about doctrine versus let's just wild, wild west, get creative and go with it following a critical process, right? So I would say, yes, the doctrine can, you know, we do have doctrine in a way of how we process wargaming and the red teaming aspect, but the let's get creative part of it, it, it really is going to be driven by the industry or the client or what it is, why we're doing it, right? So if you think about it, the center of gravity or the motivating factor for why something's occurring and why you're wargaming it may be very unique and there may not be a lot of doctrine out there right on, on uh you know how to properly play the red team and that's where i come back to the critical versus creative thinking use your critical process you have the steps in the war game you have steps i and, and i have i do have doctrine that says how a red team should operate, right? Or what's the expectations, what you need to do prior to the, the war game, during the war game, post-war game. And then uh, I also look at it though as, hey, we're gonna have to get creative because there isn't a lot of data or information out there for this specific type of scenario or course of action, right? So to answer your question, yes. We use we do have doctrine that lays out the process and of, of how the red team is going to operate. But when they're actually leading up to that in certain parts of that process, we have to get creative in order to be able to be as much of a subject matter expert as we can in thinking like the enemy or the adversary or the competitor. Yeah, and from a competitive perspective, I think I think with that, um, it's all about the the preparation. I think that's where red teaming is uh, what makes or breaks a, a, a good red team or a good war game is getting fully into the mindset of your competitor. And so, you know, we talk about, you know, I think the big part of that is making sure that the work is done on that particular company and getting fully immersed and saying, I am the CEO of, of Walmart. So not just how much revenue they have or, you know, like, you know, Doug McMillan's background or like, but what's his decisioning pattern? You know, is he high risk? Is he low risk? Um, uh, what's the last decision he fully made? Um, how, how public is he about sharing what they plan to do next? And so it's building that psychological profile of, as well, not just about the particular company, but how that information is prepared so that when we have um, you know, a red team looking at Amazon, Walmart, and Kohl's, they all have very different revenues, but they're, the way that they um, present their inner information or the way that they make decisions or the issues that they have with their their board um, of directors, that's all going to play into that. So I think um, maybe the doctrine or the scope of red teaming for us is really thinking about too, what's what's reality for Walmart versus a reality for Kohl's. So the the other thing that comes out is you know as you're dealing with sponsors and dealing with 
uh, various private companies in particular, because most of our audience tends to work in the military sphere, but some of them expand beyond that. How do you organize a red team for a project and integrate your, your intern program with that? Because it seems like every engagement is going to have some significant differences. It sounds like from, from Lindy's perspective that you're doing company research on what is their mode of decision making? How is their board composed? When you're dealing with their financials, you're trying to figure out what markets they want to break into and those kinds of things. So how do you organize differently for your sponsor engagements than what you're doing in class? So I think it's the mindset, right? So it, it, it really is the mindset. In the classroom, it's driven the client or who's driving it is really the professor or whoever's providing that scenario for them to, to build a red team for, right? And you're, you're, you're kind of in a closed environment that you have some control uh, you know, features in place so you can get the desired outcome. And the colonel does this really well. Uh, I think on the applied side, where we're doing it in the CRAT lab with these real world clients, we rec well, the first thing we do to organize for a red team is, do we have any students that have an understanding of the that industry? Have they worked on projects that, you know, are in that competitive landscape? so that, you know, they can think like some of the competitors and that Lindy brings up, you know, Kohl's and Walmart and, and, you know, all of that, the Amazon and everything. Do we have anybody that's actually done projects for Amazon? Do we have anybody that's done projects for Walmart? What were those projects? Do they understand kind of the thinking behind from their, their projects interaction with them, how they think, and then they become our red team, right? The other thing is, is we also say, okay, we're going to be wargaming this project uh, or this product. We're going to be wargaming it next week. I need you three students, you know, to be the red team or, hey, professor, you know, the colonel, can you come uh, with two students and red team for us? Right. Because we know you have an expertise in this or Lindy, you worked at Target. You know how Target thinks, you know what they're going to do. Would you mind overseeing a red team? I'll give you a couple students. You guys have a week to learn more about, you know, what you're going to be red teaming and to get more in the mindset of that industry or those competitors. Um, same thing on the, the law enforcement or government side. If we're red teaming something for them, we're going to look for somebody uh, that maybe has an expertise in that, give them some lead time so they can prepare for it and then come in. And then we all sit down in the lab and say, all right, step one war game. We're going to do this. Right. Here's the action. What's the counter action, red team, for them making that move or, or if they do that? All right. And what's going now? We go back to blue. What's going to be your counter action to that reaction? Right. And so organizing the red team um, can be challenging at times, but it can also be very easy at times because we have that CRAT lab. Odds are we've done some type of project in that industry because I've learned that. If one company or somebody's interested in what we're doing, there's probably multiple companies in that industry that are also interested. So ultimately, we're going to do numerous war games on similar competitors or in the similar industries because they're all interested at a time because there's something driving the need for that product that we're doing for them or that to, that war game. And, and the other part of that is how does that change depending on your sponsor? Because it's, it was unclear to me, I got the impression when we had some of our early chats that you were doing like a contract project for a particular company, mm -hmm. not just shipping an intern to the company. You know, right. some, some things would be, I'm going to send you there and you're going to learn from them. And in others, it's going to be, I'm going to work on this project with them. Um, so, you know, how have you seen sponsor requirements alter the way you structured or, or handled an engagement? So... It's interesting, right? Because right now, a lot of what we've been talking about has really been secondary research. A lot of what we're talking about involves a lot of secondary research, but we do primary research as well. And Lindy alluded to it earlier with our human capability. We teach a lot of the other disciplines. So um, really the variation in approaches with the client will depend on the amount of information we already have 
uh, the amount of information we need to get will identify those intelligence gaps. And then us going out and getting that information. Now, most of our clients, I, I got to be honest, a lot of our clients are coming to us because they don't have the expertise in that, you know, area uh, of competitive business intel or, you know, it's a government agency that doesn't do a lot of these types of projects or they don't have the expertise on staff. So it's hard for us sometimes to pull from them for the red team or to ask them to be part of the process because they're hiring us and counting on us to do it. And it's all contractual based. So we're taking on the project or the contract and saying, we're going to provide you this deliverable and this agreed upon time set. And these, the, these are the you know terms of reference and deliverables will be provided. The client doesn't care anymore. They want the deliverable. They're, they'll want to be part of the process. So I'd, say, have, I'd say too, yeah. Brian, part of it is I, I think uh, we try to be very cognizant of what industry we're working with or if it's national security or if it's the private sector that's going to influence our approach with red teaming or how we put together a final product based on what the customer is is used to absorbing. Um, absorbing, is that the right word? Um, I don't know. But based on what, what the consumer is of that information um, is used to. Because if we go through this rigorous process and they've never even done a, a red team uh, or that approach, you know, I think we're going to get less out of it than than making sure that it's in the format that they're they're used to as well. So we've got a, a related audience question that I think really would help because the school has been in place for quite a while and your your red teaming with business in particular seems to be a more recent event than from your founding, although it sounds like it's went on for quite some time. People are really interested in getting you to describe more examples of the kind of business war games and red teaming that you've been doing. Well, I will say this was probably one of my biggest challenges, and this is really where we rely on Lindy's uh, expertise, because where the Colonel and I come from, you know, war games has been going on for centuries, but it's been more at the tactical or a strategic level in the way of, you know, national defense or, or some type of military operation, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, whatever it is, right? So now, you know, coming into the corporate side of it, it's softer, right? It's softer and it has a different approach. And Lindy and I have talked about this, even the terminology that you use has to differ. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when we get into the business wargaming side of it, same process, but you are looking at it from a different scope or aperture because when we're doing it on the tactical or strategic side, we're talking about an enemy or an adversary. When we're on the business side of it we're talking about competitors we're talking about more industries and markets and things like that as opposed to a traditional you know battlefield operation or some type of strategic national defense operation so lindy's actually been very uh educational to our program in bringing in her experience in doing that and i've learned how to do it over the last couple of years you know out of necessity as well um but yeah it, it is new i think the full scope of wargaming is kind of a new thing in the business community. It's been there. Some have done it well. Target's probably one of the better companies that have done done this on, when Lindy was yeah. there. Yeah, and, and I think, too, it depends on the sector for a business war game. So if you're looking at, like, a pharmaceutical industry or you're looking at oil and gas, they hands down, they've done this. They've done scenario planning. They get very detailed because they have their – you know, one product could be billions of dollars or they've got to know what the oil pipeline is going to be like for the next 50 years. So they better get it right. So I think it depends on the industry of like the depth that you go into. Um, I'll share an experience of, of what I uh, briefly did with um, the Colonel's class a, a couple of weeks ago is of, of a type of, of business war game that would come up. So a type of question that, that you might be able to answer. And again, it depends on the industry. For me, I was in retail. It might be, um, you know, uh, what happened? Let's 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 assume that um, the example I used in the class was that um, Giant Eagle was looking. It's a Giant Eagle is a, a local grocer around here. They have maybe four billion in revenue. Um, so that particular 
scenario is we're saying, okay, this is plausible. This is plausible that Giant Eagle could be bought. How do our how, how do our customers or how do our competitors react to this? The goal not necessarily being that like we think that that's actually going to happen, but to get into the mindset of, um, you know, what if? And so are we prepared for um, something like that to happen? So whether it's a mergers and acquisition, um, it could be a product launch, either the company is going to launch it or we think that a competitor is going to launch it. Um, uh, or it could be, you know, um, Merle mentioned it too, moving to a new geographic area. So once we set the scenario, we pick the competitors <clears throat> kind of to be on a, a spectrum. The idea being which one's very likely. So, uh, you know, looking at like a Kroger that would buy it versus a huge giant like Amazon. Um, and of course, we always have to have Walmart if we're Target. And so we broke the, the, the students up into their teams. One group was Kroger, one was um, Giant Eagle, uh, Walmart, and Target. And the goal being, we would give each of the groups the information about, again, how the executives make decision, what's revenue, what's recent moves that they make, what's in their 10K, what do they talk about in their annual um, annual reports, what are their strategic priorities? Um, and all of those things come together to be able to say what's plausible, what would actually happen? And so then the students are in their groups, They we say, okay, Giant Eagle's up for sale. Who's willing to buy it? <clears throat> Who do we think is likely to buy it? So then the groups, they're, they're in the mode of Walmart or, or uh, Kroger, and they're working through those different um, you know, well, would we actually buy it? Why would we buy it? Does this certain does this fulfill a certain need? And then after that round, everybody comes together and says, who's likely to buy Giant Eagle? And it's like Kroger. Okay, well now Kroger and Giant Eagle, you guys sit together and then talk about how are they gonna roll this out? How are they gonna make it happen? And what's the impact gonna be to those particular companies? So then round two, they go through and say, what tactics are you going to use to defend against this um, uh, uh, rollout. Um, how are we going to maintain our customers? And the Giant Eagle Kroger team is now working together to say, okay, um, how do we how do we roll this out? And then when everybody shares out again, it's the idea of, okay, uh, here's what Kroger says that they're going to do. Are we well prepared against that? So then everybody does a share out. And then at the end, we come back together and now we're all target. Now we've got our target hat on and we say, wow, what did we like that we heard? What's concerning? Are we prepared to defend against that? And then they take those and, um, you know, that's when it would move on to, you know, the courses of action and the monitoring plans after that. But really it's, it's um, you know, I think Colonel, we did that one in like a half hour. And yeah, I, I, was, I was gonna comment on, in fact, it was, I just wanna say it was marvelously successful. The students got a, a great deal out of it. But we did press them. We wanted them to make do it fast, not badly, but fast. And it was amazing how the synergy worked. And I, I, I think that's a perfect example of the kind we've done. And I, and Lynn, do you have any more about that? That's one? It. I wanted Thank to you, add Colonel. Yeah. Colonel, can oh, I pick you? Yeah. Can I pick you back on one thing she said while it's still fresh? Sure. She said, "What if scenarios?" I will tell you, in business wargaming, there is not enough proactive "what if." in developing reactions to that everything seems to be almost reactive in something that's already occurring that they are trying to be reactive about i, I will point out the auto industry right the auto industry did not do a, a good enough war gaming for what if scenarios such as what if there is a global pandemic that affects the supply chain right could yeah. that happen maybe before covid Every, there was a lot of people that had a bias that said that would never happen. And it happened. What happened? Semiconductors were not war game properly by the auto industry. And it completely shut down entire plants of production. All they had to do was what if that and, and war game it. So. No, no, and I agree. I wanted to add one little thing that I, that I just brought to mind. Some of the things on the academic side, because I'm, you know, to me, uh, what Brian uh, top does with respect to CRAD is our, is our, is our, uranium 
And this is what really helps us be able to put those students into those situations where they can thrive and, and yes, and have real clients and have real customers and all those things. I'm on the true academic side, I'm somewhat of a free radical by virtue of the fact I don't have to play any particular games. I'm allowed to get truly the opportunity. For example, a few year, a few weeks back, as you remember, especially Merle, you were in Ohio when the when the North Norfolk Southern train went off the track. And basically it happened on what they and I I turned it over to my the competitive intelligence, the more senior group in my my group that that Lindy knows well. And basically on a Thursday, I gave them the scenario that I had one team was going to be looking at it from a uh, going, you know, from a Department of Transportation perspective, one one team from the from the state of Ohio and one obviously from Norfolk Southern. And for them to come in by, by Tuesday with an idea of just how this would play out in terms of the what if scenario. And I will tell you, if you've ever, and any of you that are blessed with being in academia, and especially around great students, in the in the space of from Thursday to Tuesday, those students got so amazingly educated in all of their areas, so that when we came together on Tuesday, it was a magnificent class. But the predication, the reason I bring that up is that we were saying, well, we don't always have the expertise. And I agree with you, in a perfect world, for example, Brian will you know, deputize my, myself or Lindy or whatever, bring some ep- expertise in. But when you, you're talking with students, I will tell you, you give me 48 hours of research on students with open source, and they're going to come to that next class ready to rock and roll. Am I, am I right, um, Brian? Absolutely. Lindy? So this is one of the areas that there's being increased spe- um, examination by professionals and uh, government. Uh, Connections Netherlands has done uh, exercises and talked about how dairy companies were trying to move their dairy business from the Netherlands into Germany. Uh, we've had things about fisheries from Canadian yep. uh, representatives that came to U- Connections USA and Connections North. So this, that's an important part of the future. Now, one of the other things we talked about in our preliminary conversations is you're also doing physical security red teams, which are significantly different than other components. And I have to be sure that we covered this because the next section, uh, next presentation we have is Roger Mason, whose original background was in SWAT teams. And he talks a lot about red team security and hazardous and live shooter exercises. So I wanna talk about what you all have been looking at and doing in that area. Yeah, so I love this. And we try to find every opportunity we can. Unfortunately, we don't get as many as uh, we want to, but. Physical red team is simply, you know, we're evaluating a company's security and how well they're protecting their facilities, their intellectual property, collection on their widgets. So what we do is we'll put a team together that goes out and does primary collection. This is human collection on the security of a company, right? So let's pick a company that makes widget X. Well, how far can we get into that company and can we actually obtain widget X? Can we attain the IP on how widget X is built? Can we get in, you know, inside the company's cyber footprint? Can, you know, we're, we're not hacking, but we want to find vulnerabilities in the network, right? In their vulnerabilities. So we will take our cybersecurity program. We will take our our intelligence analysts, and we actually have collection classes that are taught as part of the curriculum on collection. We will go out to a company and physically collect on them uh, to see if, you know, we've we've been able to make badges, right? So we've been able to make actual badges to walk right through the front door of a company because somebody left their badge hanging in their car in plain sight, right? So that's a physical security risk. So the purpose of that team is to physically go in and find the vulnerabilities in both the data network or the cyber uh, network, as well as the physical location itself. And how far can we get into that company and what can we extract and walk away with? Right. And and so it's it's a lot of fun for the students. It's a lot of fun for us, but it's actually that red team is something that's extremely important to the security of these companies. I'm not going to lie. I was sitting in a meeting 
And I had a CEO telling me, I'm sitting in an office, in his office, that I just walked right into. And he's talking about this new intellectual property that they developed and the new widget, the prototypes were being ready to be sent to a government. They're on a government contract. And, you know, th this is secret level stuff. And the three widgets are sitting on the table right next to me that he's talking about. He gets up and leaves. There's nobody around. I picked him up and I walked down the hallway, walked out the front door, came back in, put him back on the table, waiting to see what the reaction would be. Nobody even knew I did it. Okay. And I was able to use that as an example to get that company to hire us to do red teaming for them, right? Well, yeah, I mean, back in the old days, one of the big things we, we had as an issue, even in DOD prior to 9-11, was companies would issue car decals to get through the gate. Yeah, I know whose car to break into and get their laptop. Exactly, exactly. So that's what the physical red teaming is, is we're basically finding the physical vulnerabilities in your network or your physical location for both safety and protection, but really so you can strengthen those vulnerabilities. So and who better than a couple college kids to do this, right? Who better than that, you know, have and some college kids come back and they're non-threatening, right? So yeah. yeah, that's our physical red team. So there are two other things I want to be sure that we cover that we talked about prior to the conference. One was, you know, because we're doing so many things online, when you run events, or there things you do different virtually, or there are tools that you use, to uh, connect to customers and sponsors. Yes. Um, so I'll be honest, we don't do a lot of red teaming with clients and customers. We do a lot of uh, war gaming and red teaming internally for a client or a customer. Um, I, you know, I have been talking to a lot of potential clients, especially this week, uh, you know, about them wanting to learn how to war game better or them needing a red team for their war game and hiring us to do that and giving our students the opportunities to do that under our supervision. So I think that's something that's coming down the future pipeline for us. And we're going to have to figure out how that collaboration can be done virtually. Uh, we do a lot of things virtually though with our clients. So we have platforms, we're able to sync with our clients. We've been doing remote before remote was cool. Um, we were doing remote years before the pandemic, right? So it was a smooth transition for us. Uh, and we actually helped a lot of our clients with that same transition. But we have a lot of platforms and tools that we use that are both internal and external, able to be uh, used externally, URL-based, web-based. There's other things that are housed locally with us. That'll, that might be a challenge, but I, I'm not thinking we have to make any real modifications when we get to doing actual virtual wargaming events with clients, um, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of modifications okay. needed. So there, there's one other thing I want to hit before we move towards closing out, because we have about 20 minutes left on the official schedule. And sure. that was, you know, when you work on a project, uh, a lot of the stuff in the classroom is informal, but students have class projects and they have reports on their internships. And when you've got a sponsor, you're doing some kind of data analysis and after action reporting. What mechanisms do you use to pull that stuff together? And is there, you know, are standard elements that you include in your after action reports that, you know, we're looking at it from the standpoint, what might you be doing different than other organizations? Well, I, I can speak from how we're doing it in the applied world on the CRAT side. And I think they're using some of the similar stuff or will be in the classroom. We have a program called RecFast. So RecFast is a project management database, right? So with RecFast, we're able to control all of the data analysis needed, the taskings needed. Our team leads have a way to task, subtask, receive back the information, the data, really do all of the collective needs of project management. Um, using a digital platform. And then we also have a tool we use called First Light. First Light is a knowledge management tool. So when we're done with the project, we will push all of it to First Light. So First Light can, is our program of record for knowledge management. After action reports, any data with the product, anything like that will go into that platform, which is housed locally by us. Um, so there's no risk to that data getting out. Um, and same with RecFast. It's a platform that is housed locally with us. Uh, so 
that's really how we do it. The, the data analysis part of it, holy cow, we need a whole nother two hours to talk about how we collect all of the data and all the processes we use and everything. But I will tell you something very unique that we do in the way of our data analysis. We have what we call multifunction teams. So we, we have our Intel analysts, students, working with data science students, working with cybersecurity students to all come together on one team. The Intel analysts learn what, how to leverage that data scientist and what they can build. That data scientist learns why they're building it, right? You build an AI, you're building an AI. You don't necessarily know the person building the AI, AI doesn't really understand the uh, what that AI is really needed for. They just know how to, to build it, to go out and retrieve data, bring it back, scrape it, whatever. What we teach our data scientists, why they're what the project is, why they're doing it, what the results we're looking for. So that way they can make a better scraping tool. Now, they're making tools that are able to pull all this data, which frees up the analysts to do more analysis, which frees up the analysts to also go on to like the dark web and stuff for data collection, come back together and spend more time answering the intel gaps from the analysis than they're having to go out and do all the scraping. They constantly are feeding the data scientists new keywords, things like that, so the data scientists can build more refined uh, programs. And then we use our cybersecurity students as experts to help explain things to us to get us better data if it's we needing uh, the project to have sort of cybersecurity aspect to it. So with those multifunctional teams and all of the tools that we have, we have right now between vendor provided tools and databases and some of the ones we've developed ourselves, we're pushing 78 uh, different tools in the toolbox for these analysts. They don't use all of them, but they know, hey, I. I can use these four for this project or these eight because they're built for that specific platform where I know that's where I can go to get the data I'm looking for. Um, and then knowledge management again. It's all about knowledge management, right? The military is horrible at knowledge management. The government's horrible at it. Private sector is horrible at it. But I'm telling you, there's a tool out there that makes it so much easier to and automate that process. Uh, the automation of it is, uh, is is amazing with this first light platform. So, Peter, Merle, you know, Merle, if, if I could add one other thing, and went well said, uh, but the, also the reality is he mentioned the fact that we're we're not just in cahoots with some of these other functional areas. We're under the same umbrella, literally, in terms of we have right now we've just had a reorganization. And thankfully, I think it's it's once again something that keeps the light folks together. For example, it's intelligence computing and global studies. So you have a really an umbrella and all of us were on the same, for us in, in uh, the cyber stuff, we're on the same floor, we interact and our students are very, very often are, are the same students that are taking in both both sides. So I think the beauty of this isn't, it's not like the Hatfields and the McCoys. We're not in competition. What we are is trying to figure out how do you create that kind of synergy? Okay. So there couple things that I want to hit to be sure we've covered these before we finish. Number one is, if you want to have a whole session on data analysis, we do have connections in the future. Uh, <laughs> so that's always an option. Uh, the second thing, and it's always an important one I like to ask, is what should we have talked about that we haven't? I, I will say, I was just thinking this. AI is not a cannot war game. I don't care what anybody says, AI cannot war game and it cannot red team and it cannot analyze. AI is a research assistant, okay? You have to have the human interaction and the analyst to properly do a war game, identify and adjust on the fly. The AI will only take you so far. Yeah. It will. It is a strictly critical process. That creative process that's needed to get the proper outcome from a war game and a properly red team has to be done by the, a human analyst. And I'm telling you this because I've heard a lot this week about chat GPT and chat GPT being able to war game everything and chat GPT being able to, you know, red team it themselves. And no, I'm going to tell you, I've exhausted that. So we talked about breaking something. I sat in my office with three of our brilliant students and we broke chat GPT trying to, use it in a similar manner that we would for wargaming and how we do wargaming. Yeah, we, we we've had some professionals work with that and everybody that we've conferred with that says it's not ready for prime time. 
it, it, it's not, and I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think you can ever take, you can, I don't think anything, Wargaming may be able to be uh, automized at some point, but the red teaming part of it, I will tell you will not be able to be. You have to have a human analyst doing the red teaming. They can use AI as an assistant, but you've got to have a human curator on the red team. So the last two things I want to do are, the, are, are this. One, we have a short video that lets people actually see the facility and the layout, mm -hmm. and here's some student endorsements of the program. So it's sort of the commercial, but what I want people to be doing that are watching is to ponder if there are any last questions that they want to add in the comment section, because we'll come back after that video to see if there's anything that you still have questions about. So I'm going to run the video next. There was um, a lot of things about Mercer's that I loved when I came to visit, but the one thing that really sold me was the Intelligence Studies program. When I came here and I visited uh, for Day of Intelligence Studies and then again for Open House, um, I was impressed by the, for the professors and their level of knowledge and expertise, and that really was something that I had valued and st saw as a, a good indicator of will I get a job in the future? You know, Will these people prepare me? And with the level of expertise that they had, I had no doubt in my mind that they would set me up to reach, you know, my end goal, my dreams, which would be to work in the intelligence studies or in the intelligence community. For me, the, this is the number one intel school, not only because it's the uh, most established uh, uh, civilian uh, intelligence school, it, offer, uh, it offers a uh, curriculum that not a lot of other universities, actually in fact only a handful of universities offer. Um, and being the longest running curriculum, um, it offers an experience and expertise that the other universities are not able to offer. Intelligence Studies is a program where we take the ideas of creative thinking and research and meld that into actually a profession where you are trained how to best um, kind of think through problems and analyze then what you're seeing and so we teach you a lot of analytic methods that can make sense out of what's going on in the world. The thing that's most exciting is when like you find this little itty bitty of information and it's like a red string and you keep pulling on it and you keep finding further information and just like that I guess search for it is really just like it's an exciting and like thrilling feeling. The work that you're doing can actually impact lives on the ground and that's the most rewarding feeling that you can have. So a bunch of information is thrown at them and they actually apply it. So they learn the theory first and then they get a chance to apply it which not only helps really uh, bring it all together and make sense, but also when they go for interviews, whether it's for an internship or whether it's for the job itself, they can say, not only do I know what I'm talking about, but here I can do it. So they can show a written piece of work that demonstrates that they have the ability uh, to assist that decision maker. We have a program called CIRAP where you get hands-on experience as an analyst or doing intelligence work and you do it right on campus. Some of it's paid, some of it's not, but either way it's a great thing to put on your resume. And we also get emails every day about people outside of the school community who are looking for interns or for applicants for jobs once you graduate and they have a multitude of different companies that are looking for people from Mercyhurst with this degree. We have the largest program of applied in an applied nature. Um, we have over 1,700 alums currently in the intelligence community, many of whom reach back out to our students regularly to provide them with job postings. Um, we have a very high placement rate. At the end of four years, our students are expected to basically find a job. Um, this program, its strength is in being able to prepare the workforce. I've had supervisors that try to explain to me what intelligence analysis is, or they'll talk to me about the intelligence cycle, and, I, and then they'll pause and they'll go, wait, you're a Mercier student, you already know all this. And it's just that moment right there that I'm like, yes, you know what, I, I thank you for recognizing that I already know this, because yes, I went to the school where they prepared me and that I know what I'm doing, so you don't even have to do this. This would be something that they'd have to do with any other incoming employee or intern, but they don't have to do it with me because I'm all ready to get out there and do my job. Okay, so um, I note that we don't have any additional questions online. So this is your chance to make your uh, your capstone comments before we sign off. 
Lindy, you want to start? Lindy. Well, I think based on my facial expression, absolutely, I'm ready to respond to that. I, I think, you know, the, the big thing is <clears throat> we find value in wargaming and red teaming, whether it takes, whether we do it for 30 minutes or we do it for, you know, a full two week session with our students. But the idea is to get them into that mindset of what it's like to be um, the competitor um, and be sure that, you know, they know the mechanics of it. So with, when they move on and they go into their particular roles, they're able to apply that um, even more in depth. I agree. Colonel? Yeah, I am. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm in my fourth year. So bottom line is come May 14th, I'm going to be seeing some of my freshmen graduate. And I will tell you, it's been a wonderful experience by virtue of the fact and this actually this conversation we've had today fortifies the feeling that we we're preparing our students and we're preparing them in all the right ways to the point where it's it's a lifelong learning perspective on their part because i will tell you i know top has the same thing and i know lindy will now when she's been here a year or two is by virtue of those students keep coming back to you even the graduates all of those alumni a lot of those alumni you'll still get emails from and I think, once again, it's that whole issue of being able to be focused in terms of making that experiential learning happen and have it in a way that, that takes the best of the best with respect to issues relating to whether it's 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 a conversation or, or a debate or definitely the issue of red teaming. And I'm really proud of the fact that we do it every day and we're being consistent with it and we don't vacillate from it. And our students are the difference. And, you know, as I think Ronald Reagan said, and when he was General Electric Theater, um, that General Electric progress is our most important product. It, at Percyhurst, our students are our most important products, and they demonstrate that every day, and we get the feedback accordingly. Um, well said. I want to thank all of you, Merle. I want to thank everybody for their time yes. today. I'd love to. I, we really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to speak here at your conference. Um, I know it gives me great pleasure in knowing there's an organization out there focusing on wargaming and keeping wargaming uh, moving forward and, and continually growing. Um, I, I'm I I'm not one who likes stagnation. Um, I like progress, and so I think your organization is really progressing in keeping wargaming. Uh, on the forefront of being a useful structural analytical technique and almost essential one. And I just hope you guys got something out of uh, our, uh, you know, briefing today and a better understanding of how we do red teaming and the importance of red teaming. And uh, hopefully this will strengthen your red teaming moving forward. So Thank thanks you. everybody. Appreciate it. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Yeah, and we'll still take questions on Discord after the event, so uh, we'll be able to get those to you. So thanks, everybody, for watching, and I'm going to close out the broadcast. Thank you.